Consider the octopus. He's no mammal. He doesn't even have a backbone. And yet he commands a public popularity that your average rat or even orangutan could only dream of. The secret to the octopus's success? It's brain. This incredibly weird structure from our biased vertebrate mammalian perspective. The brain is the result of an evolutionary process hundreds of millions of years removed from our own, creating an organ that looks on the surface nothing like what we've come to expect a proper honest brain to be. And yet, there it is, flagrantly producing behaviors we prefer to associate with vertebrates. Researchers say cephalopods, a category that includes octopus, cuttlefish, squid, and their living fossil cousin, the nautilus, have demonstrated quick and complex learning, a capacity for decision-making, and even, controversially, tool use. Frankly, octopuses are freaking amazing. Hidden in their fabulous brains are lessons scientists are only beginning to tease out about the evolution of the human brain, the nature of complex behavior, and the brain architecture underlying consciousness itself. Awesomeness starts with decision-making, something cephalopods excel at, because they are delicious. Everybody, or anyway, every marine carnivore, wants to eat a cephalopod, and the cephalopods don't have much going on physically to stop that, so they've had to learn to be wily. They've developed this toolkit of defensive responses, ranging from squirting out ink to moving quickly in little jets of water blasted out of their bodies, to an incredible ability to change their color and texture and literally vanish into the background. But if you have all those options available, you can't really use them to your best advantage if you're just stuck in a reflexive, instinctual escape mode. You have to be able to look at the specific situation, weigh the possibilities, and make choices about the best kind of escape. And cephalopods can do that, to the point that it's a little freaky. You know how when you were six and you learned about chameleons and you assumed that that meant you could stick a chameleon in front of any background and it would immediately match, you know, plaid, neon blue, lame, whatever. And remember how disappointed you were when that assumption turned out to be wrong. Cephalopods, as it turns out, have those kind of camouflage abilities we always wanted from chameleons. They can match color with near-perfect accuracy, they can also match texture and patterns. And better yet, when they don't want to blend in and disappear, they can actually create moving patterns on their flesh, like some kind of living jumbotron. They're able to do all of this because their skin coloration system is completely different from anything else. They don't just use these things to hide, they can also use color change to communicate. For instance, one really common behavior among both octopuses and cuttlefish is what's known as a passing cloud formation. Uh, basically, uh, you get this series of dark lines that starts at the cephalopod's head and moves all the way down its body to the tips of its tentacles. As far as anybody can tell, the passing cloud formation is meant to startle prey and trick them into moving, while the cephalopod itself remains still, reducing blur that might otherwise cause the ceph to miss its dinner. It's not a very friendly sort of communication, but it really could be communication, the cephalopod equivalent of sneaking up and going boo. Even more impressive, they can send multiple messages at the same time. So where does all this awesomeness come from? Make no mistake, cephalopods have big brains, larger than any other invertebrate, and compared to body size, well up the size ladder on the vertebrate scale as well. In terms of processing capacity, they're packing upwards of 500 million neurons. Now, that's minuscule when you compare it to our 100 billion, but it's pretty good for a non-primate. The weird thing, though, is that those 500 million neurons are not all in one place. What you see here is an octopus brain. Kind of. That caveat is a big part of the weirdness going on. Benjamin Hockner, professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, is regarded as the top cephalopod neurobiologist, and he separates the cephalopod brain into three parts. This is the first part. That's the central brain of the cephalopod. It contains about 50 million neurons and is located in the center of every cephalopod's head wrapped around its esophagus. The second part is actually two parts, the optic lobes. They're behind the cephalopod's eyes, but outside the rest of the central brain. And there's about 80 million neurons there. So that's 130 million neurons accounted for. Where are the rest? All over the place. Two thirds of a cephalopod's neurons are part of this peripheral system that runs along each arm. 
And this division of labor says a lot about the nature of the cephalopod brain. On the one hand, you have this dense, lobed brain tissue, like the stuff that makes vertebrates awesome. On the other hand, you have invertebrate architecture running parts of the body in ways no vertebrate can easily comprehend. The cephalopod peripheral nervous system is a great big hairy deal, very important to the way they live. These ganglia aren't separate little brains, each off doing its own thing. Don't make the mistake of thinking cephalopods have some kind of multiple personality disorder going on. Instead, ganglia function as a way to speed up processing when it comes to motor skills. According to Benjamin Hockner, the central brain sends a command, and the distributed ganglia work out the details of creating complex movements. And these movements are very complex. A cephalopod has eight arms, each covered in suckers, as many as 300 per arm in the octopus. And these suckers are not inert. The octopus is not your bath mat. Suckers do the work of taste and smell, and each and every one of those things is maneuverable on a fine, detail-oriented scale. The suckers can work alone or together, an octopus can pick up an object and then move said object up its arm by having rows of suckers work in series to pass the object along, like some sort of team building exercise designed by H.P. Lovecraft. The central brain just says, I want that. The ganglia handle the coordination that makes it happen. Fascinatingly, this might not be the only kind of distributed processing going on in cephalopods. Think back to those camouflage abilities, especially their skill at color matching. Now consider this. Cephalopods are colorblind, so how the heck does that work? Scientists have long known that cephalopods have light-reflecting skin cells, which allow the creatures to display colors taken directly from their surroundings, even if they can't detect color themselves. But Roger Hanlon thinks he's found another possible explanation. Based on everything we know about color perception, Cephalopods really are colorblind, in their eyes. But recently, Hanlon and his team published on a surprising discovery. Out in the skin, far from the eyeballs, they found the active gene that codes for the exact same light-sensitive opsin molecule that's found in the retina. Normally, you'd only find that gene active in the eyes. That could mean that cephalopods are sensing light with their bodies, as well as with their eyeballs. Now that still doesn't answer the question of color vision, but it provides a possibility. So far, Hanlon and his team have only looked for the gene signature of one kind of opsin molecule. It could be that other opsins, tuned to different colors, are hanging out out there as well. Another possibility is that opsin molecules might interact with the multicolor pigment-filled chromatophores to somehow create a sense of color. The cephalopod brain presents us with a second distinct model for what an awesome brain can look like and how it can function. As Jennifer Mather put it, if the cephalopod brain bears any relationship to ours, it's not because we evolve similarly. It's because that's just how intelligence works. Being awesome seems to mean having a dense processing system and the ability to preferentially enhance connections that are used repeatedly. It also means finding a solution for making your processing happen faster, but the cephalopod model suggests that there's more than one way to do that. All of this has big implications when we start thinking about how we might design artificial awesomeness in our image. Benjamin Hockner is currently participating in European research aimed at developing a flexible, self-maneuvering robot based on octopus neurophysiology and behavior. The goal is to produce a robotic system where a central processing unit compiles sensory information and sends commands to periphery processors, which do the work of actually moving the limbs. Hockner thinks this system will be easier to control. Basic movements can be embedded into the distributed processors, and when an order comes down, creating the right complex response becomes simply a matter of combining a series of simple movements. Simplicity is really the name of the game here. Human brains are ridiculously complicated, and copying them doubly so. But if what you're trying to do is create a system that can engage in some basic awesome behaviors, Cephalopods provide a model for getting to that functionality in an easier-to-understand package. Today, researchers are making serious progress on answering the big questions about how the cephalopod brain works, how it relates to behavior, and what all of this tells us about how brains work in general. But to reach those ultimate goals, to use the simpler cephalopod model as a backdoor to creating awesomeness, 
Scientists say that the research will have to get a lot more interdisciplinary than it currently is. Part of what's held this research back, and what still limits it today, is the fact that individual scientists tend to focus either solely on behavior or solely on the neurobiology. There isn't a lot, a lot of overlap. To get some more clear and usable answers, that gap will need to be bridged. Essentially, we'll have to do what the octopus central brain itself did, bringing distributed ganglia together to form something that can think bigger and think faster.